Russian involvement in the Great War effectively ended with the October Revolution of 1917 as the Bolsheviks under Vladimir Lenin turned towards internal concerns. The end of fighting on the Eastern Front allowed the Central Powers to send significant troops to go try to break the stalemate on the Western Front, but fighting continued in the East as Russia descended into a civil war that outlasted the Great War. Often forgotten in that struggle was the foreign intervention in the Russian Civil War. Troops from some 13 nations participated in various ways in the fighting in the Russian Civil War, trying to achieve various goals and objectives. And among those were troops from the United States, where Americans were fighting and dying in the bitter cold of Russia, even after the end of the war in Europe. The North Russia Expeditionary Force, otherwise known as the Polar Bear Expedition, deserves to be remembered. Russia was involved in World War I from the start, when Tsar Nicholas ordered a mobilization to defend Serbia from Austria-Hungary on July 30th, 1914. The mobilization prompted Germany to declare war on Russia, which soon cascaded into war across the continent. Despite having the largest army in the world in 1914, the war soon became a disaster for Russia. Only five months after the war began, in the winter of 1914, a Russian military officer complained in his diary that there's not enough food. People are starving. Many soldiers have no boots. They wrap their feet in rags. There are great losses among infantry and officers. There are regiments with only a few officers left. Especially worrying is the state of artillery supplies. I read a commander's order not to use more than three to five artillery shells per cannon. Reinforcements comprising 14,000 soldiers were sent, and they lacked rifles. Russia's initial bullet manufacturing was as low as 13,000 bullets a day. Russia had massively overestimated their grain production, which resulted in years of rationing and starving soldiers. Almost as serious was Russia's lack of military equipment. The empire lacked heavy artillery production and only began producing it in 1916, after years of war. General Anton Denikin recalled that during fighting in May of 1915, Russian artillery did not respond to overwhelming German bombardment. We had nothing. Almost 75% of heavy artillery shells were imported into Russia. Despite their need, the Allies only had so much to give. British Prime Minister Lloyd George told the Russians in the fall of 1915 that our own needs are greater than those of our Allies, suggesting that the Russians limit their requests. Russia ordered almost 4 million rifles from the United States, though some firms delivered only 10% of what was ordered. Without a doubt, these shortages contributed to the outbreak of the Bolshevik Revolution. In 1915, a German offensive on the Eastern Front was so successful that it has been called Russia's Great Retreat. The Germans had more manpower, triple the light field artillery, and as much as 40 times more heavy artillery. A Russian general reported in July 1915 that military losses were due to, among other things, a lack of artillery shells, which he called the most important, most alarming shortcoming. Just 10 days before the beginning of the October Revolution in 1917, the Russian Minister of Food Procurement acknowledged in public that there was almost no grain storage to feed the army or the public in St. Petersburg. Mass protests broke out against food rationing in Petrograd, modern-day St. Petersburg, on March 8, 1917. February 23rd in the old-style dating, which resulted in Tsar Nicholas II's abdication. Military officials hoped that Nicholas's abdication would end unrest, but ultimately unrest continued, with conflict between the provisional government and popular organizations called Soviets, a word which means council, which were largely led by Bolsheviks. Growing Bolshevik support was caused by ongoing food shortages and military defeats. The Bolsheviks supported immediate withdrawal from the war, and Germany supported them by transporting Vladimir Lenin and supporters from Switzerland to Petrograd. The Red Guards, a paramilitary group formed by the Petrograd Soviet, seized the Winter Palace on November 7, 1917. An armistice between Soviet Russia and the Central Powers was included on December 15th, and the Treaty of brest litovsk was signed on March 8th. Russia's exit from the war presented a significant problem for her former allies. The Allies had sent large amounts of supply to Russia since 1914, largely via three main ports, Arkhangelsk, Murmansk, and Vladivostok, and had been building up in warehouses. Also at risk was the Czechoslovak Legion, where a volunteer force of ethnic Czechs and Slovaks, along with former Austro-Hungarian soldiers recruited from POW camps, hoped to win support for an independent state after the war. Between 40 and 70,000 of the Czechoslovak legionnaires were still in Russia when the treaty was signed, strung out along the poorly maintained Trans-Siberian Railway. Fighting between Bolshevik forces and legionaries broke out in May, and Czechoslovak soldiers captured the railway and secured all of the major cities in Siberia, including Vladivostok, which they declared an allied protectorate. 
55,000 German troops moved to Finland, which threatened Allied supplies at the port of Murmansk. Finally, and importantly, the loss of the Eastern Front meant that Central Powers could move considerable forces to the Western Front. Almost immediately, Russia descended into a multi-sided civil war. Fighting was primarily between the Bolshevik Red Army and a loose collection of Allied forces called the White Army. The White Army was far from politically homogenous, with factions often having little in common except that they opposed Bolshevik rule. Various other forces, such as Ukrainian anarchists and numerous others, battled across the country. British forces landed in Murmansk in March 1918, the day after the signing of the brest litovsk Treaty. In August, white Russians had overthrown the government in Archangel, and Allied units, including a small contingent of Americans, entered the city in August 1918. The United States had entered the Great War only in April of 1917, with troops arriving on the Western Front as soon as June of 1917. Wilson was not initially interested in sending forces to Russia. His chief of staff called the intervention nonsense from the beginning. But the plight of the Czechs received attention stateside. He wrote in his memoir that he posed intervention as it would add to the present sad confusion in Russia, but that he supported a military action to guard military stores and for helping the Czechoslovaks. With that, Wilson ordered men to Russia. Britain, on the other hand, had more ambitious goals, hoping to reopen an eastern front. British Foreign Secretary Alfred Balfour even said that it is not necessary that the troops should be completely trained, as we anticipate that military operations in this region will only be of irregular character. The U.S. 339th Infantry Regiment had originally been bound for the Western Front as part of the 85th Division. The 339th was mostly made up of draftees from Michigan, along with around 500 soldiers from Wisconsin. Made up of factory workers, farmers, office help, and school teachers, as one soldier described, so many of the men were from Detroit that the unit was commonly called Detroit's Own. The 339th formed the core of the American Expeditionary Force, North Russia, also known as the Polar Bear Expedition. The 339th was joined by the 1st Battalion of the 310th Engineers, the 337th Field Hospital, and the 337th Ambulance Company. But while in England, they picked up the influenza, the Spanish flu. Before they even reached Russia, men were dying aboard the ship. 65 members of the 339th died of influenza in September alone. They first traveled to England with the 85th before being reassigned. Under the command of Colonel George Edward Stewart, a recipient of the Medal of Honor, the 339th was chosen in part because Michiganers and Wisconsinites were expected to handle the cold better than other regiments. Ernest Shackleton, himself only recently back from his harrowing voyage, lectured the regiment in London on conditions in the Arctic. They were re-equipped with Russian equipment, handing in their Lee infield rifles for American-made Russian Mosin Nagants, as ammo for the Russian guns was expected to be plentiful. Replacing the Browning machine guns were water-cooled Vickers, which proved to be useless in the Arctic cold. One American soldier described British enthusiasm for the mission. We'll just rush in there and re-establish the great Russian army. Russia's former great armies will rise to welcome us. Some were disappointed to miss the big show in France or to be sent to an unknown country to fight an unknown enemy for an unknown reason. Unfortunately, by the time the Allies had secured Archangel, the war material was already secured by the Bolsheviks. A small force of Americans, along with the protected cruiser USS Olympia, which had been Admiral Dewey's flagship at the Battle of Manila Bay in 1898, had already been engaged to cross the Russian tundra since August. Sailor Harold Gunnis later said, We ran out of ammunition and food. I was young and didn't have the sense to be scared. The 339th was immediately thrown into the fray when they arrived on September 4th to save lost American sailors somewhere in the wilderness. Soon they were engaged with Bolsheviks, and American soldiers were dying in the far north of Russia. To make matters worse, a British officer had deposed the anti-Bolshevik sovereign government of northern Russia, Though quickly reinstated, the locals became wary of the Allied forces. Frederick Poole, the British commander of the theater, thought he would be able to seize Wolligda easily, gathering an army of 100,000 white Russians, meet up with the Czechoslovakian legion, and sweep west to Moscow and Europe. Despite these ambitious goals, he had fewer than 10,000 men under his command. The 339th was split up and sent across the front line, seeking to capture key points. While the Bolsheviks largely retreated at first, the Allied forces were spread thin in untenable outposts. As the fighting raged, Leon Trotsky came to realize that the Allies weren't just there to hold off Germans in Finland, but to overthrow the Bolsheviks entirely. Trotsky began building the Red Army and reinforced the northern line to push the Allies out. 
Poole was replaced by General Edmund Ironside, a veteran of fighting on the Western Front, in October. and He immediately ordered a halt to advances, recognizing how precarious the front was. As October turned to November, one American waxed that Old Boreas, the Greek name for the North Wind, came down upon the devoted company of doughboys. As November approached, news of German entreaties for a treaty to end the war in Europe reached the Northern Expedition. And as early as October, French forces on the Western Front simply refused to fight, shouting that the war is over. On November 11th, the same day that the armistice took hold in Europe, American forces were engaged in the bloody Battle of Tolgas in northern Russia, in what became called the Battle of Armistice Day. There, 600 men, about half of them Americans, along with Canadians and members of the Royal Scots, held off several thousand Russians. In the fight, troops of the 339th were saved from encirclement by close-range fire from a Canadian artillery regiment, after which a desperate bayonet charge, led by Lieutenant John Cudahy of Company B, inflicted heavy losses on the Bolsheviks and forced them to retreat. Throughout the fighting, the Allied forces were constantly outnumbered. British, Canadian, Polish, and even Chinese units were supported by Cossacks and recruited Russians, although Russian units repeatedly proved unreliable, with some simply switching sides. One man has to do the fighting of ten, and we can't replace men when they fall, one American complained. Beside the steadily growing number of Bolsheviks, the Allies also had to contend with the absolutely miserable cold. Temperatures descended to negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit or colder, causing the water-cooled Vickers to freeze up. If a machine gun jammed, the only way of getting it going again was by taking it apart and boiling it, the soldiers reported, making them practically useless. By January, the northern 6th Bolshevik army had more than 45,000 men, while there were only 6,000 Allied troops still on the lines, along with some fickle Russian volunteers. As winter wore on towards spring, men began to mutiny more often. One American platoon signed a petition asking why they were still fighting, while corporals and Company E discussed refusing to return to the battle lines. The troops were still unclear as to the purpose of the expedition, with an exasperated Lieutenant Charles Ryan of Company K writing in his journal, We're here, because we're here. The French contingent rioted in mass on March 1st, while part of the Slavo-British Allied Legion refused to fight or join the Red Army. Company I of the 339th briefly refused to return to the lines, leading to a wide reports of a mutiny, although the army claimed that the issue was a misunderstood order and denied it was mutiny. No one was ever punished, and the company continued to fight. In mid-January, a massed Bolshevik attack along the Vega River caught some 260 Americans, along with Allied forces, unprepared, and the line was forced north. Town after town was leveled by Bolshevik guns while Allied soldiers withdrew. For 80 miles, one soldier recalled, 350 men had held off between five and 6,000 in an orderly retreat. The loss, however, endangered the entire theater. In the U.S., newspapers began complaining about the war as reports of the Vega collapse reached reporters. On February 5th, a Michigan state senator announced a resolution to immediately withdraw American troops from northern Russia. The soldiers were confused and complained that they had no idea why they were in Russia, especially after the war had ended in Western Europe. On February 16th, Wilson finally ordered the Americans be withdrawn. The Secretary of War announced the 339th would be withdrawn at the earliest possible moment. Despite Winston Churchill's support for more men to overthrow Bolshevism, British leadership decided to pull out as well. Ironside decided it was time to pass the defenses to white Russian forces and withdraw. American forces were pulled from the lines and finally reached Archangel in May and June of 1919. When they left, eight Russian brides accompanied them to the States. Glenn L. Shannon, a reporter who had accompanied the 339th, summarized the expedition in the Detroit Free Press, April 13, 1919. They have crossed the seas to help in downing a tyrannical foe. They have been sent to a Russian wilderness to combat unknown forces in a land of filth and desolation of which their strongest sensations have been stench, sickness, and death. Sturdy young men, only a few months away from the daily routine of civil life, fought on through dark, foreboding, storm-torn winter, fought with a courage and abandon that borders on the reckless, even though the cause that they are defending is as dark to them as the lightless days in the land of the midnight sun. The British attempted one last offensive, trying to link up with the main force of the White Russian Army, but soon White Russian forces were in retreat all the way across eastern Russia, and the British decided that they would get out of there as quickly as possible. Both the British and the Americans were lucky in that the Bolsheviks didn't harass their retreat. They were hoping for recognition from their governments and didn't want to antagonize the Allies, although... 
the relationship had already soured and the United States didn't recognize the Soviet government until 1933. Soon the fighting in northern Russia was forgotten. The white Russians were defeated. The Bolsheviks were left in control of the country. And of the 5,500 men of the North Russian Expeditionary Force, 244 died in combat or due to accidents. 305 were wounded, 100 died of influenza, and one died from suicide. A similar expedition, the American Expeditionary Force Siberia, which had been landed in Vladivostok, was no more successful. It was at the end of their service, as they waited to return to America, that members of the 339 suggested their nickname, the Polar Bears. At least 23 Distinguished Service Crosses were awarded for heroic acts to men of the 339th, along with 50 Croix de Guerre awards and medals from both Britain and Russia. Over the years, survivors of the expedition managed to successfully return the remains of many soldiers that had been buried there in Russia, although several dozen are thought to still remain there. On March 15, 2003, Harold R. Gunnis, who had been a sailor aboard USS Olympia, passed away at the age of 104. He had been the last survivor of the North Russia Expeditionary Force. In the end, perhaps the most painful legacy of the polar bear expedition of 1918 and 1919 was its futility. None of the expedition's goals had been achieved. Historian Daniel Bolger wrote in a 1987 edition of Military Review that the Allies had done just enough to alienate the Reds, but not nearly enough to save the Whites. But a survivor of the expedition perhaps summed it up best in 1920 when he simply said, why were we there? I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.